doing God's mission in the world, and, and we've taken some steps in that direction. We've got more steps to take, but uh, it's exciting stuff, and this kind of thing is happening all around, all around GCI. Not everywhere, but there are, there are those churches that are moving forward, and most of them are finding that they have to do something pretty radical to keep going. So that is one of those things. We can be in prayer for them. And then Clarence is just telling me about Bill and Dorothy Johnson. I'm saying that Dorothy is, is laying down more and, and that she is getting more and more tired, more and more just feeling the, the years on her. Um, I know we prayed for her earlier. We can, we can pray for her again. Let's pray for Durham Congregation as well, okay? Lord Jesus, thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for your, your word, your kindness to us, and your love. And we pray for um, Bill and Dorothy Johnson that you would give them continued strength and peace, and we pray for uh, just Bill, that you would give him some clarity of mind, but most of all, peace of spirit, and pray for Dorothy, that you would give her strength and endurance, um, as she keeps going, that she would have joy, and that she would have um, some, uh, just release from some tension and stress, and that you would give her good health in her body as well. We pray for the congregation in Derby, we pray for your wisdom for them, and direction for them, we do pray that they would thrive and move forward in the, the little corner of the world that you've called them to. And we pray the same for us as well, for your continued direction and guidance. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. 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 I think I can do it. There we are. All right. Good. All right. So John 13, verses 31 through 35. John 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while, I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said also to the Judeans. Now also I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Amen. What was the waitress's name the last time you went out to eat? Uh, okay. All right, good. Waitress, the waitress's name was Dan. All right. What was the person's name the last time you went to Starbucks, Regina? You never know, sister. <laughs> Who sold you those shoes? We don't know the answers to these questions. That is not a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing. It's life. It's the way life is. You don't care too much about them. They don't care too much about you. The barista doesn't care very much about your hazelnut latte. You don't care very much about his nose ring. That's life. That's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. It's an exchange of services. We've all interacted with people in these kind of jobs, service jobs. Pretty much all of us have been in these kind of jobs. When I was in college, I remember the feeling acutely, acutely. We were in the cafeteria. Cafeteria was where you went and got your lukewarm food, and you just sort of survived on what they gave you. It was always subpar, sub, sub, subpar, and everybody went and got it, and you just, it was the only game in town, so you ate what they gave you, and... One day, I didn't have any money because my friends were a little more well off than me. My parents, they supported me very much. I was very, very privileged. But I had friends whose parents, you know, here's your money, here's your credit card, here's your car, whatever. My parents were like, you know, here's your chicken nuggets, you know, <laughs> go get a job. <laughs> and they paid for a lot of things, but, but couldn't support me like that. So I had to get a job to survive. So... I went from the front of the buffet line with the lukewarm food to the back to keep the lukewarm food lukewarm. Where I was treated, not badly, but I was completely ignored. I might as well not have been there. I was an appliance person, which is part of the job. I was treated with disregard. And it's similar to what we see in Jesus washing the disciples' feet, which he's just got done doing here in chapter 13. Jesus puts himself in a place that's not particularly disgusting or demeaning. It's just part of life. You had a guy who washed your feet. That was a thing. You had a guy who washed your feet, same as you had a guy who made your coffee or who sold your shoes or whatever. 
Jesus didn't put himself as much in a place of groveling as a place of ignore, as a place of disappearing, not being there at all. And in their minds, Jesus was supposed to bring in the earthly kingdom. He was the Messiah, to be the king. The Messiah was to bring victory and be royalty. There was no one above him. He would be triumphant, never a hair out of place. This was the person you forgot yourself in the presence of because they were royalty. They were the king. And there he puts himself in a place of being forgotten, in a place of being disregarded. Not someone you hated. Only the cruelest and meanest of people hated their servants and mistreated them in that society and society since. Abusing your servants was considered a sign of bad character, unnecessary cruelty. Like the drunk moron at the, at the bar who's lecturing the waitress on, you know, politics or whatever. It was just not considered good form. You didn't hate your foot washer, you just didn't even know he was there. That was just life. <coughs> Jesus takes himself down to that level. Not hated, not revered, disregarded. And he says that's where you start. So our sermon title for today is Jesus on the Ground Floor. Jesus on the ground floor. Let me give you three closed lines to hang all this on today. Maybe. There we go. Jesus at the ground floor. Now on the ground floor. Out on the ground floor. Jesus at the ground floor. Now on the ground floor. Out on the ground floor. And again, we're in our series on John. John, perspective from the eagle eye. In early church art and writing, the four gospel writers were always represented by different animals, and John was always an eagle. And besides eagles being awesome, it's also an image that helps us to understand John. He wrote the last gospel. He wrote the last books in the New Testament. He was there, had an eagle's eye view of what was going on in the church, was going on between God and humanity at the time, and he could give us that sort of perspective. And that's what he did. He was writing after everyone. He was in his 90s, most likely, before he directed the writing of his gospel. He would have been familiar in the other writing in the New Testament and watching the Hatchling Church spread its wings over a couple of generations. So we started with Jesus' resurrection appearances. First, he shows himself to Mary Magdalene. Here we have an unstable woman with an uncertain background, and she's the first person Jesus appears to. Next, he appears to Thomas, the great doubter, the great cynic. Thomas was most likely out drinking that first time Jesus appeared, and here he appears to them again just for him. And Thomas says the greatest theological statement in the Gospels, my Lord and my God. And finally, to Peter, the cosmic screw-up, the great denier, Jesus sees him out, and they sit by a, by a fire on the beach. And he walks with him and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, are you my friend? Peter, are you my friend? And if you are, then join me in this work. Then join me in this work. Come shoulder to shoulder with me. Last, we talked about the God with half a heart. It was the name of our sermon last week. How Jesus appears at various Israelite institutions and festivals in the middle of John, and reinterprets them and completes them in himself. At each one of these, Hanukkah, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, he says, these are about me. I have the other half of the heart you are holding out here. These things point to me and become complete in me. And this week we are in John again. Next week will be our last week in John, and then we'll move on to another series. Here we find ourselves in what's called the Farewell Discourse of John, which happens during the Last Supper. The Gospels all go in a sim similar format. At the very beginning, they clip through what's going on. You might have months between paragraphs. Jesus is here, he's here, he's here, he's doing this, he's doing this. And then in those last quarter or so of the Gospels, they slow down to a grind. And there we see the details of Jesus' last few days and then his resurrection. This brings up our first hanging point today. Jesus on the ground floor. Jesus on the ground floor. And here we are at the Last Supper scene. There are libraries of books written on this scene. Every detail from the seating arrangement to the volume of the words spoken has been analyzed by far better minds than me for a very, very long time. In 
and far worse, too. You can just sort of write books about it and people will mind. Anyway, <laughs> we have to keep in mind that there was a Passover feast at the time. It was hours long, the feast. The, the Last Supper was not your usual 45-minute dinner party. It was hours long. There were breaks in there for contemplating the history of Israel, saying the songs, singing, doing things together. Every little detail had a story behind it. There were several breaks going on. It was rich with history and culture. It took a long time. So here we are at the beginning of the night, and Jesus does something that is no less than shocking. Chapter 13 and verse 1. It's a great, good coffee pause. You can just say a reference and everybody looks down and you can... <laughs> now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose up from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist, and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now here is climactic writing, if there was any. In this scene, the music would be rising, the scenes would be flicking around the screen very quickly. All of it would come together in this huge crowning moment, and then Jesus would get down on his knees and wash feet. You see that, how it waves together in this climax, and then at the climax, Jesus is down on his knees, scrubbing people's toenails. These huge themes, Jesus' death, the devil, the relationship with the God, the Father, and the Son, earth shaking theology, and Jesus puts on his hairnet, jumps behind the line, and cooks up some omelets. That's what happens. He becomes, in this moment, the person you forget. He becomes the kid at the Starbucks, or the waitress with the stretch mark tattoos. He becomes the person we disregard. He disappears. He laid aside his outer garments. Is that not an understatement? Behold your Lord laying aside heaven and earth to get down with just a towel around his wa waist. Behold your Lord putting off all protection. Behold the Lord Jesus on the ground floor. Right at the summit of his ministry, fully embracing his calling, heaven and earth coming together. And what is here in the middle? What is here on the very ground floor of life? The universe and everything. Love shown through action. He laid aside his outer garments. He laid aside his rights. He laid aside who he was. He had very little clothing on at this point, and he was showing us the disrobed reality of what God's love means. It's worth noting here that John, eagle-eyed John, is the only one who records the foot washing from the Last Supper. The rest of them all record the communion. This is my body, this is my blood. John does not record that. John only records the foot washing. At this point, you would have known that, you know, Matt, Marky, and Big Luke had done it so well that he was like, I'll do something else from that breathtaking night. And John had watched the church exist for a couple of generations and seen the fighting and the infighting and the greed and other things like that and thought, you know what I need to remind them of is that time when Jesus washed our feet. So it's very interesting that he comes out and says that. Communion is instituted with the phrase, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And it was given to us as Christians to define us as a community. It's that symbolic meal that enacts the beliefs and theology that we hold in common. As much as we love and respect those who do not call themselves Christians, we don't share communion with them. We do not share the same beliefs. That's what communion is, an act of faith and belief. We don't need to do that in a mean-spirited way, but we do so with grace. If there was a group that for some reason wanted Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and atheists all to get together and have communion, I would have to decline. And I would say, no, we don't share the same faith. Communion is an act of faith. It's a definitive ritual based on a common set of beliefs. Resurrection from the dead of Christ, Jesus coming back to save us, Jesus is Son of God. Communion is a ritual of definition. But in the same moment, in almost the same breath, Jesus gives us foot washing, 
Jesus draws us into communion and then sends us out to wash feet. And he says, you wash any pair of feet that are in front of you. Communion is about sharing certain beliefs. Foot washing we do blindly for all. He says, it starts in house. You wash each other's feet. But then he sent you out to wash feet in all the world. He says, to let others see your good works, washing each other's feet, showing unity and love within the body of Christ. And then you serve each other and others outside the church in a similar way. We don't share communion with the rest of the world, people of other worldviews. Communion is an act of definition that declares we share very specific beliefs. Communion is a way of saying we share these beliefs. I have friends who believe themselves to be Christians, and yet have a theology about Christ that is not Christian. They might believe that Jesus was a great teacher or a good man, but not that he's the Savior, not that he's the Son of God but that he's a good man and we should be like him. And I know one of my best friends, we have this conversation a lot, and I have to say over and over, very, very painfully, I will not take communion with you. You believe, you don't believe what I believe. Now, do you know Christ? Does Christ meet, Christ meet with you by his refracted light of grace? Sure as he meets with me. But I will not meet you at that table, but I will wash your feet all day long. That's part of the deal. The Mormons would love for us to come and take communion with them. They would love to take communion with us. Because they believe they are Christians. Mormons will tell you they are Christians. And it's just not true, I'm sorry, to say their theology is not Christian. They, it's very, very, very different. They don't believe that Jesus is the only son of the only God. And that's a whole other <laughs> conversation in itself. All that to say, the communion, we draw a fence around the table at that point, because that is in-house. But a Mormon walks in the door with dirty feet, and we wash them. We wash them, no matter what. They can go right back.